Hello everybody out there. Um, this is my complete series on um, Don't Stop Going to Churches. And uh, basically, you know, I made this series because uh, sometimes God calls people to stay into the churches or the Bible buildings, as some people call them. But like, you know, sometimes he calls you to stay in the churches so that you may, you know, save people, even if it's corrupted, or sometimes even to bring people out of the church. Also, I explore um, the good of home churches and things like that. And um, so it's the complete series of Don't Stop Going to Church. And then at the end, also, I have the church exposed to where I show how the Freemasons and the Illuminati and even the Satan, literally Satanists themselves have infiltrated the church to corrupt it, to bring the world into the church instead of the church believers going out into the world. So um, check it out. Uh, I put it all together in one big series. I uh, hope you enjoy it. Um, I hope it's a blessing to you. Uh, remember that they, the evil is in the church, but um, you know you have to be able to discern whether the Lord calls you to stay in the church or to come out of the church. Because he did say, be separated and come out of them and to come out of Babylon. So like Bob Marley said, don't let them fool you or school you, but stay uh, watching for Yeshua God is love, and we love God. Amen. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Hello everybody out there. Uh, this is the tittle of the day for today. And today it is over, um, don't stop going to church. And, um, I don't know if this is for everyone. Um, you know, for a while there, I didn't go to church at all because the place where I lived, I, the churches that I did try to go to, I didn't, um, I just didn't like it. I didn't have a good feeling about it and the things that were going on there. And so for a while, I just stopped going to church like altogether. And, um, but then I kind of always had something in me to, that I wanted to go, you know, and talk to the people and, you know, try to minister and stuff. But a lot of times, like, they didn't want to listen to anybody but the one preacher that was there. Right. Okay. So I find that kind of strange because it's almost like a cult, you know. So, uh, but I was thinking about it and I was like, you know, what uh, the Father and Jesus and the Holy Ghost really want in a church, an assembly, a congregation, is uh, the building that you go to, right? Is that um, he wants disciples in there. Someone who, they, when they come in on, you know, whichever day they choose to go to church, that they, they, they talk about things that they did in the world, you know, and uh, for the Lord, and they, uh, you know, talk about that. They get, it, it helps other people get edified and lifted up. The other people edify them and lift it up, and it gives everyone encouragement to go back out and to do more, right? Okay. So, because we're supposed to go to the world, not the world come to us, all right? Okay, to a building, to a church. So, you know, I kind of thought about that, and I was like, you know, that's the way it should be. It should be filled with disciples, not just people who come there, they listen to the preacher, and then they go home and go live a worldly life, right? So, um, I thought about that, and then I thought about how Jesus and the disciples, they saw many wrong things in the synagogues, okay? Which are basically the same thing that we have today. And this is part one, part two tomorrow um god willing i'll make a video about what the church synagogues uh are for real okay and and how synagogues back then are, are basically churches now okay so uh, that'll be the video tomorrow but um you know it's a it's an assembly it's a place to congregate and jesus and the synagogues and the disciples and paul found many wrong things in those synagogues they found devils they found uh, holier than thou religious people like Pharisees. They found, you know, you know, all kinds of sinful things in the synagogues, right? But they didn't stop going to the synagogues, and that's what I want to show today. In the same way that we find all these evils in the church, and good, we find good and evil in the church. They say they found the same good and evil in the synagogues, but they didn't stop going, okay? Because they need, they knew that they needed to minister to those people, okay? Sometimes those people in the church or synagogues need to be ministered to more than the people out there in the world, right? Okay, so I want to show that today. Um, they didn't stop going. So first, let's get started with Matthew 4, 
uh, 23 through 25 which says and Jesus went um, went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sicknesses and all manner of diseases among the people so there were sick and diseased that's why he needed to go to the synagogue that was there at that time you see what I'm saying okay verse 24 and his fame went throughout all Syria and um, yeah, Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, um, and those which were possessed with devils. So we found devils in there and sick people, um, and who, and those which were lunatic, so crazy people out of their minds, right? And those that had palsy, and he healed them. Okay, so the crippled he healed, um, and he found all theirs where in the synagogue, the same way that we find in the church. Verse 25, and there followed him a great multitude of people from Galilee and from Decapolis. I think that's how you say that. <laughs> I'm so bad with the names in the Old Testament and with the cities. It's just, you got to forgive me, it's hard. Uh, from Jerusalem to Judah from uh, and from beyond Jordan. So you see, he went there. He, uh, he had to experience all these things that were in there, but he helped them. He, he taught them, he loved them, and then a multitude of people followed him because of that, you see? Okay, and also, uh, we can see in Mark 1, uh, 21 through 29, he experiences evil in the synagogue. And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. Okay, so he taught them at, with authority. See, if he never would have went to the synagogues, it's like saying, well, Jesus, when he came in there, he didn't teach them like any preacher does in a church. He taught them, you know, like with power and authority of the Holy Ghost, okay? And um, and not just as like as the scribes do, you know, as interpreting the scriptures. Like he, he showed them the truth and the power behind it. They had a form of godliness, but yet they didn't have the power of it, you see? And that's the way many of the churches are now. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, Let us alone! What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. So, in the synagogues you've got an, an, an unclean spirit, an evil spirit in a man. Okay, right? So he needed to go there to get that out of there. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commanded he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Okay, so you see, again, because he went into the synagogue or the church, if you will, he healed, he took care of things he needed to take care of, and he taught them, and his fame went out among the whole city, not just in the church or the synagogue. You see, that's the way we should be also. Jesus is our example in everything that we should be. So if he did this, we need to do this, okay? Also, Mark 3, uh, 1 through 7 says this. Mark 3. And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand. And they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day. So you see, he's going again, he enters in the synagogue on the sabbath day right okay whether it's well however you believe it saturday or sunday he went in there okay and and because and he even said the sabbath is for, for uh, is for man because he's the lord of the sabbath also so really the sabbath is all about jesus and pointing towards jesus because he is our rest okay you see that so it's all foreshadowing of, of christ himself he's the lord of the sabbath it, it's all about him they might accuse him and he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he saith unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days, or to do evil, to save life, or to kill? But they held their peace. 
And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. Okay, and so this is an awesome example of many churches now, like I was speaking about, that I would go into and in this certain town, and it just was, there was no love in the church, you know, and everyone was silent, but what? This one preacher person talking. Everyone else was silent, okay? You see, they kept silent. And what did it do? It angered him. Uh, it, it, it grieved him because of their hardness of heart. Okay? So he found people like that in the synagogues, as we also find them in the churches today. Okay? But he still went there and healed and helped them. Okay? He saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea. And okay, so you see, even though he went and he did something good for the Father, they, the religious people, they wanted to destroy him, okay? And, but what happened when he withdrew, the same thing. A mini multitude followed him, okay? He helped them. The, the true people knew, the believers knew, okay, well, he is doing good. He is a father. And they followed him, okay? And, and the religious types, the Pharisees, wanted to kill him. But we'll see. He did, even though they wanted to kill him, he still didn't stop going. He still didn't stop, okay? So... You know, he, he still kept going and going, um, even when they tried to kill him. Like we'll see here, the first time Jesus teaches, <laughs> um, it, 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 he prophesies to them, reveals prophecy to them, being fulfilled in front of their eyes. They try to throw him off a cliff. So let's look at that in Luke 4. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And see, notice it says their synagogues again. Okay. But he kept going. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Okay, so you see, he wasn't the leader of the synagogue. He wasn't the preacher, Jesus. But he went in. And as it was his custom to go on the Sabbath and to go um, into the synagogue, and he stood up to read, okay? So it, he was showing an example for us. It doesn't just one man who needs to stand up and read and, and to give a message. Like, all the people can, okay? And you need to share your message with everyone that's there in the synagogue or in the church. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the See, he gave it to the minister and sat down. So the minister, like in our times, the minister would have probably been like, oh, no, 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 you shouldn't read that, you shouldn't be talking, I'm, I should be talking, <laughs> right? But that's not the way it was then, and that's the way it shouldn't really be now. It's like everyone should share uh, their experiences they did in the week uh, for the Lord, and, you know, so it edifies everyone else, okay? All glory goes to God, but we, people need edification and encouragement, okay? I know when I make my videos and someone leaves a, uh, a comment that, that, you know, that it, it helped them in their life or touched them in some way, then uh, it helps me. It gives me encouragement. You edify me by leaving those comments to make me want to make more videos and keep going forward. If everybody said it was horrible, it'd be very hard to keep going forward. See what I'm saying? So you want to edify each other, okay? Not for, like, vain glory because all glory goes to God. You want it as edification. That's why Paul talks about edification for each other to lift each other up you know eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him and he began to say unto them this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears and all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth and they said is not this joseph's son so automatically what they do is they they flash back to his past they let his past get in the way of his future 
Okay, that's what happens. So they're like, oh, well, the, he's not learned. He's not taught in a, 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 a seminary. He's not like ordained by this church and all this other stuff, this uh, group of elders or whatever, you know, or a council or, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and they automatically turn on him. And it's the same way that sometimes that's what happens today. But he didn't quit going. <laughs> and he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, When the heaven was shut up three years and six months, When great famine was throughout all the land, But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Eliseus, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman, the Syrian. Okay, so it's interesting because he's saying, you know, he says this in another time too, uh, that verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. And he takes it even further when he comes back to his hometown and says they're not even welcome in their own hometown or even in their own house. So sometimes that's what happens, you know. People at the church may not want to listen to you because they know your past and they don't accept you. But you go to another city where they don't know anything about you and you speak the word with authority and power and strength of the Holy Ghost and Jesus and then they all listen to you, right? Have you ever had that experience? I have. Um, and it's, it's kind of like the way evangelists do. Evangelists go to different places and speak in different cities and countries and all that and everybody listens to them and accepts it because they don't have the past to get in their way. And that's what sometimes about stuff about the internet is kind of messed up because people can just go on the internet and search you and find out things about your past. You may have changed completely from that old person you used to be. You're a new creation now, but they don't even want to listen to you or get to know you because of your past. They're judging before it's time, okay? which is not good. <laughs> and all day in the synagogue, when they heard these things... See, all of them in the synagogue, they're figuring to kill him, try to kill him. <laughs> ...were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him onto the brow of the hill wherein their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way, and came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine. So, you see, they just tried to kill him. They tried to throw him off of a cliff, literally. You know, they wanted to destroy him. He disappeared. What does he do? He goes on the Sabbath day and does the teaches again. He's not scared. He keeps going. They just tried to kill him, and he goes to another synagogue on the Sabbath. <laughs> For his word was with power. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil, and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And, when and this reminds me of, you know, James, where James says, uh, Do you... Do you believe that there's one God? Well, good. The devils believe and tremble. You know, that's what this is talking about right here. This this devil is trembling and frightened because the Holy One of God, he knows that who Jesus is, right? But hey, Jesus tells him, you know, hold your peace, be quiet. And this is in the synagogue this is going on. Now, you see that? The devil had thrown him. But he doesn't stop going. <laughs> in the midst, he came out of it and hurt him not. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying... What a word is this, for with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the fame of him went out into every place of the country round about. Okay, so you see, same thing, we keep saying the same thing, because he went there in those uh, synagogues, churches of today, and, and did these things, fame went out about him, okay, the gospel, the good news went out about him, and he won many to believe. And he arose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. And Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever, and they besought him for her. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and ministered unto them. Now when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with divers diseases brought them unto him. 
and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And devils also came out of many crying out and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuking them suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desert place, and the people sought him, and came unto him, and stayed him, that he should not depart from them. And he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. And he preached in the synagogues of Galilee. Okay, so then he goes to another place of synagogue, and teaches, okay. Now this one I like a lot, because it's, um... Luke 13, and it, it shows exactly the religious type, the uh, holier-than-thou religious type, and how Jesus dealt with them, okay? And he had to deal with them in the synagogues in the same way we have to do them in, deal with them in the churches. And But you see someone who is bent over this woman, and she has been, you know, just, just her life is just messed up because of Satan. Jesus says it's because of Satan. She can't straighten herself out. Get it? She's bent over. And only Jesus can straighten her out. Okay? She's been in the synagogue, in the church, for a long time around ministers and godly people and ungodly people. But she can't. they can't help her straighten her life out. They can't help her straighten her herself out. Um, only Jesus could. You see? So sometimes, you know, you're the only Jesus that somebody may see in that whole church for 18 years as we're fixing to see and and jesus shines through you as light and you help these people but if he never would have went there this woman wouldn't have been just 18 years bent over uh, unable to straighten her life out by satan um she would been the rest of her life that way so he had to go there to do this but if he never would have kept going to the synagogues to the churches to us she never would have been healed and he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the sabbath and behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity eighteen years, and was bowed together, and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him, and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. Amen. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. And I guarantee you he was very unhappy because they couldn't do anything for her. You know, like he knows this woman's been bent over, unable to straighten herself and her life out. Because, she, I mean, like it says, she has infirmity, the spirit of infirmity, okay, and bowed together and could not no wise lift herself up, okay. So it's, it's infirmity, it's sickness, but it's also like circumstances in her life. Because sometimes willfully sinning brings like evil and badness on us, right, and disease, okay. You can see that in scripture. Um, but... Like he, like so, I guarantee you that the ruler of the synagogue here is upset because he couldn't do anything to help this woman. Now here comes Jesus, who is untaught, who is just working in power and authority, and he heals her. And now they're upset with him, you know, not just because it's on the Sabbath day, but because they couldn't do anything. And said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work; in them, therefore, come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said. Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound low these eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? Amen. <laughs> and when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. So, see, he had adversaries okay uh in the church the religious type they were his adversary okay same thing we see today uh, like paul speaks about it that there's amongst you enemies of the cross in there with you okay but you don't stop going and don't stop like helping people right i mean he had to deal with enemies in the synagogues and we have to deal with enemies in the church but we have to go there to be the light of it okay all right um now same thing happened with paul we can see that in acts 14 um, 1 through 6 which says this act 14 
And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude both of the Jews and also of the Greeks believed. But the unbelief... See, he never would have saved uh, Jewish people or Greeks if he wouldn't have went into the synagogue. Okay? Leaving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Long time therefore abode they, speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, See? and Amen. granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews, and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles, and also of the Jews with their rulers, to use them despitefully, and to stone them, they were aware of it, and fled unto Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lycaonia, and unto the region that lieth round about. And there they preached the gospel. Okay, so you see, they um, they got persecuted. They did what was right. They got persecuted. They got out of there, but then they went somewhere else to preach, right? And then we'll see he's fixing to go to another synagogue, and things happen, okay? So he, Paul didn't stop going either, okay? He kept going even when they tried to kill him, just like Jesus. Okay, he said, be imitators of me as I also am imitators of Christ. Okay, we are to imitate Christ in everything that he did and said. He taught by what he said, but he also taught by what he did. Okay, and that's what we should follow. And now let's look at Acts 17, uh, 1 through 14, which talks more about Paul. Acts 17. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them. Same thing with Jesus. Paul's manner was to go in there and teach them about the gospel. The same thing with Jesus. His custom was to go into the synagogues and tell them about the good news and the kingdom of God and heaven coming and him, right? The Messiah. <laughs> them and three sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scripture even three Opening sabbath days he was there christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead and that this jesus whom i preach unto you is christ amen <laughs> and some of them believed and consorted with paul and silas and of the devout greeks a great multitude and of the chief women not a few but the jews which believed not moved with envy took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. So you see, he won many people, and some of them believed, and, and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Jew, the Greeks, a great multitude, and the chief women, not a few. So he won a lot of people to the Lord. But then... There are a lot of people stood up against him and wanted to tear him down, okay? So when you go into the churches, there are going to be a lot of people who are going to listen to uh, the word when you speak the truth. And there's going to be a lot of people, even though you're speaking the truth, that are going to deny it and attack you for it. So we got to be ready for it and brave and, and have boldness of Paul and Jesus and the disciples and just keep doing it, okay? Don't be scared to go to those places and speak the truth. And when they found them not... They drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received. And these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And so you see, they were trying to use government against them. Government in the churches, but also government of the, the all of society, right? It would be like... Obama saying you can't talk about like Jesus saying he's the king of kings you can't talk about it in, in this place or that place or at your job and all this and then you go do it and or even in a church and you go do it and then they're persecute you for it and try to deliver you over to the government and what did Jesus even say in John he said they'll they'll kill you thinking they do God a service right so this is the same type of thing here that's going on and what's going on in these end times too and it's just gonna ramp up and get worse and worse and worse and they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. Okay, so you see, as soon as all of that just craziness happens, what do they do? They leave in the synagogue of the Jew. And then listen to this. This is awesome. Uh, verses 11 and 12 show 
they, the way we all should be, okay? Uh, whatever we hear somebody say uh, in the church or in the synagogue or out in the world, we should do exactly these two verses. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily Amen. whether those things were so. Amen. Therefore many of them believed also of honorable women which were Greeks and of men not a few. Okay, so again, honorable Greeks and men not a few. Before he said not a few women, but you know, not just a few women believed a lot. And he said not just a few men believed but a lot, okay? And why? Because they were searching the scriptures and that's what we should do. That's why I tell people all the time, don't just listen to what I say. You know, just take it, whatever I say, and if, if you believe it or if you don't believe it, take it to the Scriptures and see if the Scriptures agree. If the Scriptures agree, then you know it's the truth, okay? So always search the Scriptures. Don't listen to any man or woman. Uh, don't put your faith in them. There's heresies among all of us. We put our faith in Christ and look to the perfect man, Jesus, and not to any man or woman on the earth, okay? Because they're going to disappoint you. They're always going to disappoint you, okay? You take the nuggets that you get from them, learn to learn to eat eat the meat and spit out the fat, right? Okay. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to the sea. But Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens. And receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus for to come to him with all speed, they departed. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him, when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Hmm. Therefore, So, see, he saw the whole city just given in to idolatry, okay? And, I mean, we just see it sometimes in the church, but, you know, it's hidden well in our society that... There's all, all this idol, idol tree going on through television, through media, through it's just stuff everywhere, you know, statues and things like that everywhere. They just paint it as something different, you know, that it's just entertainment or advertising or things like that, but it's idols. Buted he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Okay, so he disputed <laughs> he uh, therefore disputed he in the synagogues with the Jews and with devout persons okay so uh, he disputed not just with uh, uh, the Jewish people who are religious type and with the devoted persons God honoring persons in the market daily with them uh, that met with him so he he argued with them showing them he is an apologetics right he is the de for defense of the gospel so even though they were trying to argue the scriptures back against him back and forth he didn't stop going to the synagogues even they're arguing him, with him even the devout people of God if they were arguing with him he was speaking the truth and he kept going back Paul and Jesus and all the disciples you see so don't stop going to church okay don't stop just keep going um, and spreading the light of Christ there. All right. And, um, you know, Hebrews 10, 25 says, Forsake not the assembly. Okay. That the assembly, the congregation, that is the church building. Okay. Church is has a, uh, a pagan worship sense to it okay that's what that word church means okay well really we should be calling them the assemblies or the congregation or the gathering together places of Jesus's people okay the people of the way all right Christians um, of uh, forsake not the assembly of yourselves together as the manner of some is okay and I did it too I was one of these the manner of some I was one of the some but exalting one another how are you going to exalt somebody else and edify them and lift them up if you ain't going there okay for um, and so much the more uh, as we see the day approaching okay and I know you can edify and lift up someone in a house church that's still people call it a house church or a house assembly or whatever it's the same thing so I'm not just saying it has to be those buildings anywhere God's people are gathering together assembling congregating you need to go there okay and you need to be part of it okay so you can help so you can love so you can edify and lift up and teach okay um, also um, 1 John 1 5 through 7 says uh, this then is the message which we have uh, we have of him and declare unto you that God is light right and Jesus is the light of the world and we are the light of the world who, and he shines through us okay and in him is no darkness at all if we say that we have fellowship 
okay, with him and walk in darkness, okay, um, we lie and do not and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, how are you going to shine if you are constantly in your house, you know, not going to the darkness of the people in the world and shining your light? As he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us all uh, from all sin. Okay, you see that? Um, also, we can see in John 16, 1 through 4, says this. John 16. These things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended. Amen. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Okay, so you see, even though he's saying this, he still went back to the synagogues after this. Okay, he's telling you, this is going to happen to you. Okay, it's going to happen to you if you keep going, but don't stop going because you need to help people. You need to not love your life to the death. Okay, you defeat Satan by the power of the blood of Jesus in your testimony and not loving your life to the death because you're not afraid of death because we don't taste death as Christians because he's delivered us from death, right? Okay. Um, so you see he's warning us here that these things are going to happen, but don't fear death. Keep going and uh, do God's service. Um, right? And this is, I mean, this is pointing to God. Uh, they'll kill you do, uh, thinking they're doing God's service. That's That was Saul, Paul, right? Okay, and that's a prophecy of him. It's also a prophecy of Islam and, and false churches that are going to do these things. But you still keep going. Okay, some people will be martyred. Some people won't. But martyrdom, like, is is an example you know take up your cross okay to be like jesus and these things will they do unto you because they have not known the father nor me but these things have i told you that when the time shall come ye may remember that i told you of them and these things i said not unto you at the beginning because i was with you because he was protecting them you see um so i mean you just how are you going to help anybody if you don't go, you know, and if you don't, like, you know, participate in some way and, and spread the truth, you know, spread the gospel, spread the love of God. I mean, I, I mean, I see it. I mean, and I know I used to be the way to where I didn't want to go either. And because certain people would discourage you and all this other stuff. And you see all these wrong things and the preacher would say wrong things. But you know, every man says something wrong in, in their teachings, you know. I mean, the Holy Ghost speaks through us, but then a lot of times our, you know, human mind takes over in parts, and it's, it's, you know, where the flesh and the spirit are constantly battling each other. It's just the way it is. And any person who says that this doctrine is perfect, or this translation, or this um, um, interpretation is perfect, you got to watch them, okay? Those are where the cults come from, and that's, you know, scripture is no private interpretation, okay? So to end it, uh, 1 Timothy 3 14 through 16 says this These things write I unto thee, uh, hoping to come unto thee shortly. So he, Paul, even wanted to go back to the churches, to the, to, uh, the synagogue, not the synagogue here. He's speaking to the church. So he's saying, I want to come back to you. Even though the Corinthian church was already corrupted. Okay, here where Timothy was, it was already corrupted. The early church was corrupted even. But Paul's saying, I wish to come to you shortly to the church. Okay, the assembly, the congregation. All right, you see? <laughs> and, and John was the last to die. Okay, all the churches are corrupted at that time. But that, what do you think that the first couple of books of Revelation was about? To the churches, to the believers, to the spiritual sense of it, the believers themselves, but also to the churches that were in the city. So he's speaking of the, the building, but he's also speaking of the people in it. And he's saying, I have good things to say about you, but I have bad things to say about you. Because so it was already corrupted. It's always going to be that way because people, human beings aren't perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. Um... But I, if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou ought to behave thyself, where? In the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillars and the ground of truth. 
and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. So he's saying, you know, this is how you should behave uh, in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, which is us. Okay, these are two different things. One is the literal building. The other is the spiritual sense, us, as the temple of God. Okay, um, the pillar and the ground of truth. And that's why he says it's a mystery of godliness, right? Um, God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, uh, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Okay, that's Jesus. Okay, manifested in, God manifested in the flesh. Also, Jesus said, I do not pray, Father, that you take them out of the world, but you keep them from the wicked one. Okay, same thing here. We are not to be taken out of the church buildings, the assemblies, the congregations, the synagogues. We are to be kept separate from the wicked one, Satan, and shine our light in those places. Okay? Um, I hope you all understand what I was trying to say. Uh, it just makes a whole lot of sense to me, you know. Uh, you know, they didn't stop going to these places that had corruption in it, and neither should we. Okay? Uh, wake and watch for Yeshua, God is love, and I love God, amen. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Hello everybody out there. Uh, this is the tittle of the day for today. And, um... Today, this is part two, and don't stop going to church. And um, today, what I want to talk about, basically, is what the church really is, okay? And, um, you know, most of you know that we are the temple of God, right? Okay, now. And so, kind of what I want to show is that um, that uh, God is not in the church itself like people will say you know he is in the church his spirit is in the church right or he is in the church but uh, the father himself only has one house okay and that's like the lord's house or the house of the lord or god's house or you know okay different names you call it but it's a bethel and the only real one is jerusalem okay the temple that's yeah like in isaiah 6 it says you know that his tr train his robe came into the temple okay the earth is his footstool so when the reason that god is in the church buildings um is because many many believers are there because we are the temple of god and um we are the temple of the Holy Ghost, and that's why the Father is in there. His presence is in there, because the believers are in there. But the believers, we could be outside in a park, and if it was a, a lot of group of people, then his presence would be there. You see what I'm saying? So, he doesn't abode in literally in the church buildings, okay? The only one that he literally abodes in is the temple in Jerusalem, which is, that's why one reason that the Dome of the Rock, it, that's an abomination of desolation that shouldn't be there because it's like covering that, you know, to where, you know, the Father doesn't go into that place because it's unclean. It's it's not sacred and holy to him, okay? So, uh, that's what I kind of want to show is that basically there's only one house of God or Bethel and that is the temple in Jerusalem, and and what the church buildings really are, they are uh, like a synagogue of old. Okay, they're a uh, assembling place. They are where the congregation comes together to worship um, and to fellowship. All right. Okay. So let's get started first with um, only one house of the Lord, God's house, Lord, Lord's house, our house of God. And we can see this in Second Kings seventeen twenty three through twenty nine, which says this: Until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his <laughs> servants the prophets, so was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Cutha and from Ava and from Hamath and from Sepharvaim and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which slew some of them. Wherefore they spake to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations which thou hast removed and placed in the cities of Samaria know not the manner of the God of the land. 
Therefore he hath sent lions among them, and behold, they slay them, because they know not the manner of the god of the land. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Carry thither one of the priests whom ye brought from thence, and let them go and dwell there, and let him teach them the manner of the god of the land. Then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel, and taught them how they should fear the Lord. Howbeit every nation made gods of their own, and put them in the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made, every nation in their cities wherein they dwelt. And the men of Babylon made Succothbena, and the men of Cuth made Nergal, and the men of Hamath made Ashima. Okay, so, see how... Ancient Israel went in captivity many times. Why? Because they started making these Bethels all around. Okay, the, they did like the Samaritans and Babylonians. They mixed it together and then they, they started making these things. And, and when that happened, <laughs> the Lord wasn't pleased. You know, because he only his only house abode is in Jerusalem. Okay, and we'll see later that he didn't even really want that house. You know, that it was David that wanted it really. Okay, so... Um, they started making all of these places all around and and God got upset and he was like you know you th that's not what happens even in ancient Israel uh, with Moses the, there was the tabernacle and it moved and the Lord moved with that tabernacle you know where the Ark of the Covenant went right by day he was showing them where to go and by night he rested in where the covenant was okay in that tabernacle okay so it, it's only just one of his house, his abode, okay, his the Bethel. Um, but they went into captivity because of things like this that they did, um, and and other things like we can see in Amos three, uh, fourteen through fifteen that uh, that in the day that I shall visit the transgressions of Israel upon him, I will also visit the altars of Bethel. And the horns of the altar shall be cut off and shall fall to the ground. And I will smite the winter house with the summer house. And the houses of ivory shall perish. And the great houses shall have an end, saith the Lord. Okay, see, see, he wasn't pleased with those. Okay, because they were, they were pagan worship at the same time mixed with... Um, you know, real worship for the Father, okay, for the one God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right, the one true God, all right, so, um, he wasn't happy with them, and there's other verses, too, that you can go, if you want to do more research, and see that, that ancient Israel went into captivity because they started making all these Bethels all over the land, and he didn't like it, okay, he just didn't like it, um, also, okay, there's many, many different types of believers and children of God, but there's only one house of God, okay? So we can see in Isaiah uh, 44, 3 through 8, that there's many, many different types of believers, okay? And different ways of, of, of worshiping, okay? And it's not always about, like, you have to go to this building and do it, okay? For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessing upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water forces. One shall say, I am the Lord's, and another shall call himself by the name of Jacob, and another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord, and surname himself by the name of Israel. Thus See, many different types of believers there. Okay, uh, and... Uh, worshiping and doing things in different ways, okay? Saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And who, as I, shall call and shall declare it, and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people. And the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. Fear ye not, Neither be afraid. Amen. Have not I told thee from that time and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Nope. Yea, there is no God. I know not any. They that make a graven image are all of them vanity, and their delectable things shall not profit. And they are their own witnesses. They see not, nor know, that they may be ashamed. 
Okay, so you see, there's many different types of believing, and um, you know, it doesn't have to just be worshiping and stuff in a building. Okay. Um, also, we can see the same type of thing in Revelations 11:18 through 19, which says this: "I am He that liveth and was, and and, and see how it here in Isaiah, um, He says, "I am the first and I am the last, and besides me there is no God." Okay, that's verse six. All right, now same thing in Revelations. Oh wait, no, I got the wrong one. Hold on. Um, Revelations eleven eighteen and and the nations were angry and 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 thy wrath the <laughs> sorry and thy wrath has come and the time of the dead uh, that they should be judged and thou sh and thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets okay that's one type of believer the prophets and to the saints it's another type of believer and them that fear thy name another type of believer the small and the great Okay, like small Baptist churches, but huge Baptist churches. You see that like all the time, small and great, different, like all kinds of different churches are like that. And um, and and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And verse 19, and the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple uh, the ark of his testimony. And there, there were uh, lightnings and voices and thundering and an earthquake and great hail. Okay, so you see, in, especially in verse 18, there's many different types of believers there, okay? But only one house of God, okay? And we can see that in Hosea 8, 1 through 14, which says this. Hosea chapter 8. Set the trumpet to thy mouth. He shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law. Israel shall cry unto me, My God, we know thee. Israel hath cast off the thing that is good. The enemy shall pursue him. They have set up kings, but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not. Of their silver and their gold have they made them idols, that they may be cut off. Thy calf, O Samaria, hath cast thee off. Mine anger is kindled against them. How long will it be ere they attain to innocency? For from Israel was it also. The workmen made it. Therefore it is not God. But the calf of Samaria shall be broken in pieces. Okay, you see? And you see how at the very beginning it says, He shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord. You see? Okay. And he's talking about Samaria in the same way that in Second Kings, you know, they were mixing it together, okay? And making these many different Bethels or Lord's houses, and the Lord wasn't pleased with it. <laughs> For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. It hath no stalk. The bud shall yield no meal. If so be it yield, the strangers shall swallow it up. Israel is swallowed up. Now shall they be among the Gentiles as a vessel wherein is no pleasure. For they are gone up to Assyria, a wild ass alone by himself. Ephraim hath hired lovers. Yea, though they have hired among the nations, now will I gather them. And they shall sorrow a little for the burden of the king of princes. Because Ephraim hath made many altars to sin, altars shall be unto him to sin. Save many altars. I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. They sacrifice flesh for the sacrifices of mine offerings, and eat it, but the Lord accepteth them not. Now will he remember their iniquity, and visit their sins, they shall return to Egypt. For Israel hath forgotten his maker, and buildeth temples, and say buildeth temples. Judah hath multiplied fenced cities, but I will send a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour the palaces thereof. Okay. See? So he's taking out because of these things they were building these temples, they were mixing this pagan satanism with like what is holy they're trying to take what is unholy and mix it with the 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 sacred with the defiled right they were trying to mix those two together and the lord wasn't happy about it and you see in verse 14 they build they're building all these temples okay these okay you see that um 
Um, he wasn't happy with it. <laughs> um, the uh, let's see, churches are like the synagogues of old. Okay, and we can see in James two one through two says this. James 2. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment. Okay, so you see here, that's all I need to play because this, is, I need this one word really. James is the only one here that ever calls the uh, church... Uh, building uh, uh, an assembly, okay, which means synagogue. If you look in the Greek, this is translated synagogue right here, this assembly. So, see, he's comparing the church to the synagogue of old. You see that? Okay, I just want to point that out because James is the only one who calls it that. But he calls it that, and we know that this is the Holy Ghost speaking through James, right? Okay, so it's, it is the same. James says it's the same with the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, right? He says that it's assembly, it's translated in Greek, synagogue. All right. And um, the synagogues are basically just like that. They were assembling places where, for people to come together for the Jewish people in different towns and stuff. And it was supposed to be, or it, wasn't, it didn't even come around until after the Babylonian captivity. Think about that. Synagogues didn't come around until after the Babylonian captivity. Okay. So... Uh, it was supposed to be a place for them to remember the temple because the temple was gone for a while. The true house of God was gone. So they made these synagogues so they could come in and worship and, you know, reflect on Jerusalem and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Same thing like the churches. Okay. They assembled together, congregated and worshiped and read scripture and things like that. All right. Uh, so it's, their churches are the same as those synagogues were. Um, um, it's a place for people to assemble and congregate. First uh, Corinthians... Uh, one two says unto the church of God which is in Corinthia, uh, to them that are uh, sanctified in Christ, Christ Jesus, uh, called to be saints with all that is, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, uh, both there and ours. Okay, so you see, and he says every place call upon there, but. You know, the, the the church of God was in Corinthia, all right? Um, so there he's speaking of it as a building, okay? See that? Um, and so that's what they're supposed to do is congregate in those areas for that. Um, and like I said in my last video, you, the synagogues, okay? So the churches are just like the synagogues, right? Like I made in my last video. It, they didn't, Jesus and the disciples and Paul didn't stop going to them, so neither should we, okay? We should keep going, even though, like, maybe they're uh, thinking of the of the house of God wrong, but we still keep going, you know, to help people and to spread the word and to make disciples and all that stuff. Okay, also we can see this in Hebrews 10, 19 through 25, which says this. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Okay, so that's the church, the, the spiritual body church, us. Okay, the body of Christ. This, what he's speaking about right now is us. But then he's fixing to talk about the physical buildings that we go in. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching. Okay, so like I said, my last... Hebrews 10. Oh, push on button. So how are you going to do that if you don't go there? You see what I'm saying? So, uh, and I mean, assembling together, okay, it doesn't just mean in a um, church. It can mean a house, 
church, you know, as like people like to do, you know, a, a house group, if you don't want to call it church, a house uh, assembling or congregation that people get together. It can be, like I said, in a park. It can be anywhere. Don't forsake the assembling of believers together because when you do that, then he his presence is there and stronger, okay? Like Jesus said, when two or more are gathered together, he is there, right? Okay, and so he, he is with the assembly of believers not at the building. The building is not the thing that matters anymore. The only one that ever did matter was the one in Jerusalem. That's my point. Okay. <laughs> um, so, but still, like I said, we still should keep going. Okay. I'm just trying to drive that home that we should still keep going. <laughs> okay. Um, so, also, um, the synagogue, okay, I said this, the synagogue's churches were not around till after the Babylonian captivity. Now that's kind of crazy because let's listen here. Uh, Revelations 18, 1 through 5. We see how the Lord feels about Babylon. Revelation 18. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying... <laughs> Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Okay, so you see there, the spirit of Babylon, they want to build, 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 make things bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, and then the third part that I'm going to make about the, the don't stop going to the churches, it will speaks more about this, about the birds, and, you know, which because birds represent, you know, unclean spirits, demons in the Bible usually, and um, you see how Babylon here, it got great and great and great and you know it's being infested by demons and devils okay and freemasons illuminati and things like that okay satanist basically <laughs> um and so but that'll be the next part but you know i want to show here that um god does not like babylon right <laughs> and the things that babylon does and how they mix things and he doesn't like that it's sorcery and i heard another voice from heaven saying come out of her my people that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Okay, so we come out of Babylon, right? The spirit of Babylon, the thinking of Babylon, the ways of Babylon. Like Jesus said, I do not pray that you take them out of the world, but you keep them from the wicked one, okay? But we still are in the world, and we still have to make disciples and spread the good news, okay? Uh, same thing with Paul. He said, I told you not to associate with fornicators and all these other sins, drunkards, all these other sins, right? But then he says, but I'm not talking about the people in the world. I'm talking about the believers who do these things because how are you going to save anybody if you keep yourself from sinners, okay? And keep yourself like the out of Babylon, not in out of Babylon in the sense to separate, like to not go try to help them, but don't be partakers with them. Don't, ha don't let the spirit of Babylon in you. You see, so people will tell you, come out of Babylon, don't go into the churches, don't go here, don't go there. Well, how are you going to, Jesus didn't do that. Jesus went into the places. He went where the sinners were. He, you know what I'm saying? So he, he, you go into the world, into Babylon, okay, but you don't be part of it spiritually. You see what I'm trying to say? Okay. Um, so you see that he doesn't like Babylon. Also, we can see in Jeremiah uh, 51, 44 through 47 says this, um, and I will punish Baal, the devil or Satan, okay, in Babylon, and I will bring forth out of his mouth that which he hath swallowed up, okay, and the nations shall not flow together any more unto him, yea, the wall of Babylon shall fall. My people go ye out uh, of the midst of her and deliver ye every man his soul okay see it's a spiritual thing from the fierce anger of the Lord and least your heart faint and you fear for the rumor or report that shall be heard in the land a rumor shall both come 
one year and after that in another year shall come a rumor and violence in the land uh, ruler against ruler therefore behold the days come that I will I will do judgment upon the graven image of Babylon and her whole land shall be confounded and all her uh, slain shall fall in the midst of her okay so I relate that to right here you know we're talking about all the evil uh, spirits and demons and fallen angels and just satanic rulers and stuff that are going to fall in the same way here in Jeremiah 5 that's why Jesus said in Luke Matthew 24 and um uh, Mark 13, you know, that you'll hear wars and rumors of wars, okay, right? But, you know, these things must happen and come to pass, right? It's the same thing right here in uh, Jeremiah 40, 51, 46. And least your heart faint. That reminds me of when Jesus says, men's hearts fail in them for what will come upon the earth, right, in the last days. And ye fear for the rumor that shall be heard in the land. Okay, the same thing. Uh, the rumor shall come one year of, of the violence of the land and the rulers against rulers. That's the same thing that Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24. There will be wars and rumors of wars. Okay, so But still, at the same time, he says that in uh, the same Matthew 24, they'll take you into the synagogues and, and scrooge you and, and, and hurt you and kill you even. Um, but don't worry about what you were going to say because the Holy Ghost will give you the words at those times. Okay, so he, so people obviously were still going to the churches, synagogues, and all this stuff at, in the la very, very, very last days, right? Like what we're in now, but but more ramped up to the very end. So it's speaking about that here in Jeremiah and in Matthew 24 and in Revelations. Okay, so see what I'm trying to say about Babylon. I mean, it's been going on forever ever since the Babylonian captivity really even before that to um, the Tower of Babel Nimrod okay it's all been going on and but you they constantly still had to go in and out in and out of Babylon to help people to save people to to do all those things okay um, the church is um, the church is us as believers okay and we can see that um, well, the building, the building churches are places uh, for us to help others and lift up holy hands and worship and praise God, right? Okay, so we can see this in Romans 12, which 1 through 5 says this. Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Okay, so it's interesting because he's speaking about for as we have many members in one body and all members, okay, with church members, right, uh, have not the same office. Okay, so okay, so in, so we are the body of Christ. You see that in there? And then we'll look right here at 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 12 through 31, which he describes this completely, okay, about we are the church. Our bodies, physical bodies, are the body of Christ, the temple of the Holy Ghost, the temple of God. For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. To the Holy Ghost, right? And, I mean, because even if we read in Revelations, like I made in my other video, there's a difference between the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost. And you can even see in Revelations that it says that there's seven spirits of God, okay? And the Spirit of God is the Holy Ghost. So it's, it's you know, <laughs> but, um, um, 
so the one spirit that connects us all together that makes us the church makes us the body of Christ is the Holy Ghost okay. for the body is not one member but many if the foot shall say because I am not the hand I am not of the body is it therefore not of the body? <laughs> and if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? No. Nope. <laughs> if the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. Okay, so we're one body in Christ, but yet different parts of the body, right? That's why it's important for us to continue to keep, keep going to the churches and helping people because the eye or the hand may be able to do something that the ear can't do. You see? Okay, for somebody else. All right, that's why. And it's interesting because it's, I love this stuff because it's, it's speaking about the spiritual body of Christ which is the church, which is us, but it's also speaking about the physical body, uh, okay, of, of the church, okay? And it's just like in Revelations, like uh, 1 through 3, where he's talking about the different churches that were physically there. The physical buildings of the churches were there, yes, in the different cities. But the spiritual bodies, he's speaking about that too, okay, and, and the things they did as believers, okay? So it's interesting because, it, like, Paul does it a lot, and Jesus does it. He says, you know, you're the temple of God, but then the, the church building is where you assemble, but he also talks about it being the church of God at the same time. Okay, So it's, it's interesting. It's kind of hard to understand, but yet at the same time it's easy because you have to know that the Holy Bible is like, it's three layers deep. It's like a trinity itself, the word is. It's literal, right? It's literal. It means what it says. It happened in history. And that's the way it is. But it's also spiritual, where it's very spiritual, where you take line upon line, precept upon precept, and you put it all together, and it makes a teaching for you. And then um, it's also a deeper or personal, like a, a two-edged sword, right? Like it says in Hebrews, that it cuts to your soul, spirit, and body. It goes into you. It's personal message just for you, and then spiritually for everyone. And then it's like, you know, a history, too. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. Amen. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. Amen. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. While one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. And see, that's what... The problem is, is that somehow Satan has figured out through different denominations and stuff how to separate schism. Okay, he's like, don't have any, no schism in the body, but in the, which means division, right? But Satan has figured out how to divide people into all these other places, you know, and and denominations and uh, belief system and changing. Not saying that it's wrong. What the different ways that people believe, because everybody's going to believe differently, you know. Um, you know, everybody's going to glean something different. Everybody's going to, like, what's lawful for you may not be lawful for me. Or lawful for you may not be lawful for me. But, like, you know, it is still, even though we know it's like that, we shouldn't be separating ourselves or causing schisms or divisions because of that. Okay. And that's what Satan's figured out how to do. You know, certain denominations won't have anything to do with other denominations and all this other stuff. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles... Secondary. See, now he's speaking about the, the, the building of the church, you know, or, and the members at the same time. They prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? No. 
have all the gifts of healing? No. Do all speak with tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. <laughs> but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Right. Amen. Okay. So, you see, because love, love is what you really want, okay? Faith, love, and hope. Okay? So, you, um, um, so you see, it's very interesting here that he goes from the spirit of the thing to the members of it all being together to the building itself. Okay? So, you have all three of them right there. Um, okay. So really what the church buildings are for is just like the synagogues were for, for us to come in and lift up holy hands, uh, worship, praise God, okay? Um, and we can see that in 1 Timothy uh, 2, 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, assemble everywhere, congregate everywhere, have a church everywhere, um, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, okay? Uh, 1 Timothy 4, 15 and 16 says, uh, Meditate upon these things, give uh, thyself wholly to them, uh, that they, uh, that thou profited, profiting may appear to all. Uh, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save yourselves and them that hear thee. Okay, so don't stop going to the churches because you need to speak uh, true doctrine. You need to spread the good news and you need to help people. And it will save people. You'll save people by doing that. Okay, just by them hearing. Okay. Um, also, Psalms 134, 1 through 3 speaks about this, worshiping the Lord. Psalm 134. A song of degrees. Behold, bless ye the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. The Lord that made heaven and earth, bless thee out of Zion. Okay. So you see here, uh, this is speaking literally of the, you know, the the sanctuary that would be there because he did have the the tent there right because that's where the ark of the covenant was so you see that but also uh we know we're fixing to see that david was the one who um wanted the house of the lord okay so um i don't know literally here if he's speaking before the house of the lord is built or right before the end when it was under construction but either way they had a sanctuary where they could worship because where the ark of the covenant was the tent right okay so um it's interesting that here, you know, I mean, be, this is what we're supposed to do. Behold, bless ye the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord, the Lord uh, that made the heavens and the earth bless you out of Zion. Okay, so lift up your hands, praise him in, wherever you are, but definitely when you're in those church buildings. Okay, now, um, getting closer to the end, I promise. I know this prayer is a little long. Uh, 30 minutes or so but I just want I need to get all of this in there so you know you can see all of it how it all relates together okay so now let's look at 2nd Samuel 7 okay uh, God Jesus um, well the father um, he didn't want uh, a, a house for himself anyway because he doesn't need a house the earth is his footstool right but David wanted it and David uh, it was a good thing that he was doing so uh, the Lord you know allowed him to do that okay but uh, not him but because he didn't do it because God says you know you've you've been a warrior you shed too much blood in my sight you can't do it but I'll allow Solomon to do it so let's listen to that second Samuel chapter 7 and it came to pass when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in an house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. See what, and I imagine this as he's sitting there lounging, feeling good, you know, all his enemies are defeated, he's... He's happy. He's in this big, nice, you know, house or whatever, and it's made of cedar and all this. And then he realizes just, oh, man, I'm sitting here, you know, relaxing. And 
the Lord is just, you know, the Ark of the Covenant just sitting out there, and he doesn't have, like, the Father doesn't have, a, like, a house, you know? He should have something greater than I have, you know? And he's he goes, well, I'm going to go build him something with cedar and stone, you know, to make it even a better place than any man has, right? But we'll see what the Lord says about that. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. Amen. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in? And it's got a question mark. So he's like, Shall you build me a house for me to dwell in? <laughs> Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. In all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me an house of cedar? See, he, he's saying I didn't need it. I, I don't need that, okay? <laughs> you don't need it. He, he's moving. He's a God that moves, you know, and goes and does. And okay. Now, therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more, as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. So you go again from a physical house here that he's speaking about to a, uh, a lineage, a, a family, a, a in a spiritual sense. You see that? Because he's fixing to now start speaking about David's lineage. Okay, so David comes with a physical house, but God has something more important spiritually a family which is going to be what give everybody the holy ghost because what jesus is in the line of david you see that okay so he's david is thinking physically on the earth what he wants to do but god shows him no i do things spiritually wise and when thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers i will set up thy seed after thee which shall proceed out of thy bowels and I will establish his kingdom he shall build an house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever I will be his father and he shall be my son if he commit iniquity I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men but my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, Amen. whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. And that's also Jesus, right? That's, that's how it's established, is through Jesus. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. Then went King David in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that thou hast brought me hitherto? And this was yet a small thing in thy sight, O Lord God. But thou hast spoken also of thy servant's house for a great while to come. And is this the manner of man, O Lord God? So you see, he's speaking not of the house, the house of the Lord, but the house, his family, his lineage. And what can David say more unto thee? For thou, Lord God, knowest thy servant. For thy word's sake, and according to thine own heart, hast thou done all these great things to make thy servant know them. Amen. Wherefore thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like thee, 
Neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And what one nation in the earth is like thy people, even like Israel, whom God went to redeem for a people to himself, and to make him a name, and to do for you great things Amen. and terrible for thy land before mm -hmm. thy people, which thou redeemest to thee from Egypt, from the nations and their gods. For thou hast confirmed to thyself thy people Israel to be a people unto thee forever. And thou, Lord, art become their God. Amen. And now, O Lord God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as thou hast said. And can you imagine, okay, Israel is already God's chosen people, a peculiar people. Now he's taking David and he's going, your lineage will be even greater than that. So he's taking a special people and someone out of the special people and making his family and lineage even specialer. You see that? That's awesome. Okay, and we're in line with that because we're in the body of Christ and the sons of, you know, the sons of God, right? Because when Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, right? It says that in John. But then when he leaves, he's the firstborn of many brethren. So we're in this lineage too. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> And let thy name be magnified forever, saying, The Hallelujah. Lord of hosts is the God over Israel. And let the house of thy servant David be established before thee. For thou, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, hast revealed to thy servant, saying, I will build thee an house. Therefore hath thy servant found in his heart to pray this prayer unto thee. Hallelujah. And now, O Lord God, Thou art that God, and thy words be true, and thou hast promised this goodness unto thy servant. Therefore, now let it please thee to bless the house of thy servant, that it may continue forever before thee. For thou, O Lord God, hast spoken it. And with thy blessing, let the house of thy servant be blessed forever. Amen. Okay, so you see that. Okay, so that's how the Lord works. He's like, well... He, David wanted one thing, which he got it. I mean, the house was built by Solomon, obviously, Solomon's temple. Um, but also, his lineage went on forever, right? Okay, that's us, that's Jesus, that's, you know, as believers. So, he got the physical sense of it, and he got the spiritual sense of it. But you see, God didn't need the, the house. The God didn't need the, the temple. He, he didn't need it. You know, that's Jesus even said, you see this beautiful building, Herod's temple. He said, you see these beautiful buildings and he called it a building. He didn't say, you know, like, the, the, he just said, do you see this? But it's weird because he had zeal for it because they made it into a house of merchandise. And he flipped out because of that. But at the same time, he goes, you see these beautiful buildings? Not one stone will be unturned. Okay, so it's not about the temple, okay, anymore. It's about us, the temple of God in us, okay? Everywhere else we go to worship is just a place or a building or, you know what I mean? And, but we go there and we, we worship, we praise, we lift up holy hands, we help people, we save people, we do all those things, okay? Now, at the same time, you see there, he didn't really need the house or want the house because he was moving around a lot. Like, he traveled, he said, you know, moves around. Jesus said the same thing, which is interesting because this is also going back to this here, Second Samuel 7. It's Jesus showing that he's God in the flesh, okay, because he says basically the same thing here, that he doesn't need a house, okay. Uh, Luke 9, 57-58, It came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee wheresoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. He has no house. See that? It's the same thing, okay? <laughs> I mean, you see that? I think that was pretty cool. That's the same thing there. So, it's there's only one house of God, Bethel, and that's the temple in Jerusalem, which is not even there anymore. Okay, and it's probably not there anymore in God's plan and His will, so that we know that we are the temple of God, that we are the church body, and that it, the building that we go to, that we call a church, is for us to assemble in and for us to worship and do things like that. Okay, all right. Uh, well, thank you guys. We can watch for Yeshua. God is love, and I love God. Amen. Hello, I tricked you. I'm back again. <laughs> I forgot to mention these verses, and um, uh, 
one of them I, I found uh, after I was talking about the Babylon thing. And the other one I just forgot to put in there in Hebrews 3. So I wanted to come back and put it in there. So this is the real ending. <laughs> okay, so speaking about, you know, I was talking about the church uh, from Babylon and how God feels about Babylon. But also that the synagogues came from Babylon and that the church buildings themselves now are, are kind of, you know, in Babylon in a way spiritually but especially the mega churches because they have the spirit of Babylon in them that they keep building and building and building and want to be famous make a name for themselves that is the spirit of Babylon but this is very interesting though uh, 1st Peter 5 and this is go this has always been going on right the synagogues came from Babylon um, Tower of Babel and also was going on in Jesus's t or in uh, Jesus's time but more in the early church time okay they, they were dealing with this and in the same way that we're dealing with it now. In 1 Peter 5, 13 and 14 says, The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, salute you. And so both Marcus, my son, um, which is Mark, because so, Mark is literally uh, Peter's son, okay? Um, and in 1 Peter 5, 14, Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Uh, peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Okay, so you see, they're he's saying the church, the church that is at Babylon. Okay, he's saying uh, elected together with you. Okay, they salute you. So that was going on even then. You see that? Okay, um, and okay, and then also Hebrews, Hebrews three, which just talks about the house that we are the house of God. Okay, and the house of Christ. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. Amen. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. We're okay, so that is the house that we are, is Christ's house, right? Okay, compared to the, the old houses, okay. Well, that's what I wanted to add. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Sorry for breaking in. Uh, wake and watch for Yeshua. God is love and all of God. Amen. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Hello, everybody out there. Um, this is the title of the day for today and today it's continuing in uh, don't stop going to church and this is the third part and um, there's only one more part after this and then I'll be getting into something else but um, this one today is uh, I'm going to show the type of people and entities that we will encounter and that we have to watch out for when we go back into the church buildings, okay? And when we go there, you know, to help people and things like that, um, and get people saved in the churches, <laughs> right? The synagogues, whichever. <laughs> um, so these are the people we have to watch out for that Jesus warned us about and that the Father warned us about and many of, uh, you know, prophets and um, disciples warned us. So let's get started with that with first in uh, Luke 13 18 through 19 this describes the mega churches and uh, Freemasons in them and demonic spirits in the churches and luminous and Satanists and everything else okay new age trying to move into the churches with yoga and all that stuff you know um, and all those type of things okay so uh, it especially describes the mega churches in Luke 13, and we'll see that. Okay, so let's listen to that really fast. Then said he, Unto what is the kingdom of God like, and whereunto shall I resemble it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took, 
and cast into his garden, and it grew, and waxed a great tree, and the fowl... Okay, so, first of all, well, let's just finish it. Owls of the air lodged in the branches of it. Okay, so, mustard seeds don't grow into trees, they grow into plants, okay? So, what he's saying here is, the kingdom of God, okay, what it's like is it, it grows from a mustard seed. It started with good faith, okay, and um, a good planting, and it grows. And once it gets too big, a megachurch, uh, the fowls of the air, demons, you know, because we're going to see that uh, the fowls of the air, birds, are always a representation of demonic people, uh, demonic forces, uh, satanic forces. Okay, so those fowls of the air lodged in the branches. Okay, Masonic lodges. <laughs> you see that? Like, these are little hints that, that Jesus is giving us of the, the people and the things we're going to have to deal with in these end times that we are dealing with every day, right? Okay, so you see that when they wax big, when they become too big, um, then that's the spirit of Babylon is in there also because the spirit of Babylon says uh, we will build we will get bigger and bigger and bigger and instead of it being expanding the kingdom of God which is inside of us right um, it becomes let's be organized let's be religious instead of being relationship oriented spreading the kingdom of God you become organized and you want to build an organization a religion a religious structure you see okay so we don't want the spirit of Babylon in, in churches in any church but the mega churches that's what they have in them we will build bigger bigger and bigger churches we will um, make a name for ourselves we'll become famous right like in Genesis 11 it's all of that stuff okay um, so you see that how the fowls of the air come into those places okay and um, also in Jude uh, well first of all um, Jude 4 talks about this, especially like Freemasons and Luminous and people like that. Jude 1, 4, For there are certain men crept in unawares. Okay. They creep in unawares. Sometimes they're revealing that they're Masons and Luminous and all this other stuff, but usually they don't. They creep in unawares so they can corrupt from the inside. Okay. Especially if they're 33rd degree and above because then they know they're worshiping Lucifer. Okay. Um, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Okay, they know what they're doing is condemnation, but they don't care because they are more in line with their secret societies and their brotherhoods more than um, the brethren of the Lord, right? Okay, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, right? And denying the only Lord God um, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so you see it's not good when they start creeping in and and just trying to corrupt everything, all right? Um, let's see. Yeah, and they bring in unbridled lust. They bring in unbridled lust to corrupt, all right? And also, continuing in Jude, we can see in Jude um, uh, 12 through 13 says this. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds. Trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Okay, so they're in there with us, in the, the God is love, you know, church buildings. Uh, they're trying to infiltrate the church of us itself and the buildings. And they they don't do it through love. They are they are uh, without water. You know, they're like a cloud that just doesn't have any water. They're good for nothing. Um, carried about by winds, trees whose fruit wither. And what did Jesus say? Uh, you will know them by their fruits. Okay, right? There are many who say, Lord, Lord, and he'll say, I never knew you. Right? Because you'll know them by their fruits. Okay? Remember that stuff. Okay, let's go on. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Okay, now that part reminds me of the demonic uh, fallen angels that try to infiltrate the churches in the church building and things, okay? They're wandering stars, right? 
stars are a representation of angels in the Bible. Uh, to whom is reserved the blackest of darkness forever. Okay, just we, you know, Peter and Jude, they talk about the, the fallen angels that are already in chains of eternal darkness. The rest of them are going to go there too. <laughs> okay, to outer darkness. Um, also, uh, Philippians three seventeen through 19 says this. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so, as ye have us for an ensample. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Okay, so you see, they are enemies. They walk. They act like they're walking the way, okay, in the path, the narrow gate, but really they're not. They're enemies of the cross. They're infiltrating there to get to you and to corrupt you, okay? whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Okay, so you see they're minding earthly things. They're never full, right? Okay, they're, they just, they devour and devour, and then once it's all just destroyed and, you know, the sheep are scattered, they move to the next place. They're, wool, they're wolves, they devour the sheep, and the sheep, uh, the sheep scatter, and then they go to the next place and do the same thing. It's horrible. Um, but that's why you, we that have eyes to see and ears to hear, when you go into those places, you can help those other people and run those people off. You know, Paul it, Paul said that he took people out of the church and threw them out of the church and turned them over to Satan for destruction of the flesh. Okay, so they would learn not to blaspheme. And that's what these Freemasons, Luminous, Satanists, that's what these people are, New Age, that's what they're doing. They're trying to, they're blaspheming in the building that we're supposed to go to and worship and, and help people and, you know, feed the poor and do all this other stuff, you know. And they're going in and blaspheming and corrupting it so they can destroy it from the inside out. All right. So, um, you see that? Okay, I hope you all see that. Okay. Also, now what we're going to look at is also... Uh, Aliens, okay, fallen angels, uh, demons, fowls of the air, okay. The Vatican has already said that they're way, they're watching for aliens. You know, I mean, if you know Tom Horn research and all that stuff, um, so their so-called aliens are really fallen angels, demons, interdimensional things trying to come here. Um, these are spoken of in Scripture, and we're going to see in uh, uh, Genesis 15 and how it relates to now. But first, let's see uh, Deuteronomy 28. Uh, uh, 28, 26 says, and, and thy carcass shall be meat unto, well, I'll do that in a minute. Okay, so let's do Genesis 15, 7 through 17. I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. Okay, so you see how there's a sacrifice made, right? Uh, the father tells Abram to make a sacrifice. He does it. Uh, the fowls uh, come uh, down upon the carcass. Remember that, the carcass. Uh, Abram uh, drove them away, okay? He ran them out of there, like we're talking about Paul, okay? Um, and then the, the sun was going down and a deep sleep fell upon him. Okay, so these are uh, a representation of, you know, demons and stuff coming down onto the dead body, body of Christ. Okay, you see that? The, not the body of Jesus, but the body of Christ as in the church, right? Okay, so you see that that's a representation. We're going to go on a little bit. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them. And they shall afflict them four hundred years, and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward shall they come out with great substance, and thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. 
But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, and it was dark, behold a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. Okay, so it's very interesting if you take this and compare it with Matthew, the crucifixion, okay, and see how they relate to each other, okay, because there's a sacrifice, the fowls of the air come, if we read in Psalms 22, the dogs and are encompassed around him bulls and that's like a representation of the people but it's also a representation of the satanic forces and demons and fallen angels that were taunting christ while he's being crucified also okay so but that's another study but it's very interesting if you do that but you see here i mean he's making a sacrifice the files of the air come and upon the carcass okay remember that so these this is this is a foreshadowing of demons and fallen angels and stuff like that okay so now if we look at deuteronomy 28 26 it says and thou carcass shall be meat unto all all fowls of the air and unto the beast of the earth and no man uh, shall fray them away okay so if you don't follow in line with what the scripture says this is what's going to happen to you okay because no man will be there to make them go away Okay, now why is that important? Because Abram was here to make the, you know, to get the um, the the fowl, the birds and the foul spirits and all that stuff away from the carcass, away from the sacrifice. But here, the, uh, he's saying if you don't follow in line, then there won't be any man there to wave them away, okay? <laughs> so you got to be careful when you're in there. Also, we can see Matthew 28, uh, 24, 28 says, For wherever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Now we know Matthew 24 is speaking about these end times that we're in now, right? So I thought about that and I was like, well, that's interesting because where the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered, okay? And some other translations say vultures, right? Scavenger type birds. But here, I believe this is, that's what it's talking about is where the dead uh, carcass is, where the sacrifice is, where people are still living sacrifices the the church in us right that's where these uh, demonic so-called alien things are going to gather together okay you see that um now also we can look in um matthew 13 1 through 4 which says this matthew 13 the same day went Jesus out of the house, and sat by the seaside. And great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship, and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Okay, so... He's gonna, and well, I'll just read it to just put it together. Um, and then verse 19 says, he explains what this means. Jesus explains what this means. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receiveth the seed by the wayside. Okay, so this is like... You know, you hear all these different New Age, you know, New World Order Bible translations in the churches, and it confuses people because they're used to reading the King James or they're used to reading this other translation, and they they get confused. Okay, and that that's one thing that goes on, <laughs> and then it's, it's not sown deep enough into their heart, and Satan, the wicked one, and his wicked ones come and snatch it away and and mess their brain up so they don't understand completely. Um, also, it shows that they are infiltrated in the church, okay? They are there, and basically what they are doing is there's one intercessor between man and God, one mediator, right? That is who? The man Christ Jesus, okay? He is our mediator, our intercessor, okay, back and forth, right? And the Holy Ghost is our teacher and our comforter and our constant companion. So, what they are doing is the... The um the fowls in Genesis 15 of the air the uh, the fowls the Freemasons the Illuminati the Satanists all of them they are trying to and even the you know so-called aliens they're trying to interfere between man and God instead of interceding and and helping they're trying to interfere with the relationship between man and God 
Okay, even the Pope said it's dangerous to think you can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. See, he's trying to interfere in your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what all of this is pointing to. The fowls of the air are trying to get in between it. They're, all, they're constantly doing that. You see that in Genesis 15 and through all this? Okay, so um, um, that's the same thing it says here in Matthew 13. There, it's trying to, the wicked one is trying to interfere in, in the word and your connection to it and the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Um, Revelations 18 2 says, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become a habitation of what? Devils. And, and the hold of every foul spirit, now listen to this, this pulls all this together so you can prove to anybody else that when it's talking about birds and all this stuff, it is talking about demonic aliens and fallen angels and Satan. And, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Okay, you see that? Because they're in the air. Okay, they're in the air. We know that from uh, uh, Philippians 2, 2, 2. Wherein in past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So that's what we're dealing with is the children of disobedience in the Masons and all these satanic groups, right? They're trying to infiltrate the church to interfere with your personal relationship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. All right? Um, so that's what we're dealing with when we go into those places. And we have to be ready for that. We have to know our enemy, and we have to know that the enemy is Satan and all his little, you know, minions and demons and people, okay? <laughs> so, uh, just be ready for that. And I hope this helps you to understand what you're dealing with and maybe a little bit how to deal with it, okay? <laughs> Alright, well, we can watch for Yeshua. God is love and all of God. Amen. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Hello everybody out there. Um, this is the tittle of the day for today. And today it is Don't Stop Going to Church Part 4. And this is the last one. <laughs> and today it is over um, house churches or home churches, right? It's not just about the organization buildings that uh, people go to, right? It's also like house church um, that we should go to those and, you know, fellowship with people there. And um, and it, I'm going to show like in Jesus's ministry and in uh, the early church, they did that very often. OK, and people look over that, that it's perfectly fine to uh, have a house church in your home and um, to win people to the Lord there, to heal people, to preach and to teach there. OK, because uh, Jesus is our perfect example of everything and he did it. And we're going to see that. So let's get started first with Mark 2, 1 through 17, which says this. Mark 2. And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. Okay, so he's preaching where? In a house. He's having a house church. Okay. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed, and walk? But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. 
and immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, hey, saying, man. <laughs> We never saw it on this fashion. And he went forth again by the seaside, and all the multitude resorted unto him, and he taught them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom, and said unto him, so it's interesting that he's by the seaside teaching them okay so he didn't even need uh, any kind of shelter okay he was out and about in the world teaching people uh have a church if you will okay so we should do the same things follow me and he arose and followed him and it came to pass that as jesus sat at meat in his house many publicans and sinners sat also together with jesus and his disciples for there were many and they followed him so they're having fellowship together right okay and when the scribes and pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners they said unto his disciples how is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners when jesus heard it he saith unto them they that are whole have no need of the physician but they that are sick amen. i came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Amen, right? Okay, so you see he's teaching them in a house, okay? <laughs> the religious people he's teaching in a house. You see that? Okay. All right, so um, also we can see the same type of thing with Paul in Acts 27 uh, through 12, which says this. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. So they're keeping the Passover, like right now, right? It's Passover, so it's the first day of Passover. So they're keeping the Passover for seven days. And um, so they're keeping the Feast of the Lord. Remember, it's not the Feast of the Jews, it's the Feast of the Lord, okay? And Jesus is the Passover Lamb, okay? So they're keeping that, and then you'll see they're going to have like a house church thing also. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow. Okay, so you see the first day of the week, they're breaking bread together, eating, and Paul's teaching, long preaching. Okay, they're having house church. <laughs> and continued his speech until midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft mm. and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell on him, and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. Amen. <laughs> when he therefore was come up again, and had broken bread, and eaten, and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. And they brought the young man alive, and were not a little comforted. Because they were greatly comforted, right? Not a little means greatly comforted. So he was preaching, having house church. Uh, something happened, and he he healed, and then he he preached after again after that. Okay, so that's that's pretty awesome right there. Um, but it's an example, okay, of house church. Also, we can see in Romans, I mean Acts 16, uh, 16 through 40. I know this is kind of long, but it, it's a great example of it also of uh, the work that can be done in people's homes and out in the world, not just in a church building. Okay. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. See, and even by a riverside back then on the Sabbath day, they were praying outside and, and you know, worshiping, having a, a form of church okay as we think of church today as a worship service okay we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither and a certain woman named lydia a seller of purple of the city of theatira which worshiped god heard us whose heart the lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of paul and when she was baptized and her household she besought us saying if ye have judged me to be faithful to the lord come into my house and abide there and she constrained us. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul on us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And that reminds me of, like, in James, when it says, Do you believe there is one God? You do well. 
the devils and demons believe and tremble, right? Okay, so there she's crying out because she knows that they're servants. Okay, and also the same thing with Jesus, right? Um, every time he would come around the devils or demons, uh, they would cry out, "You're the Son of God," you know, and and then he tell them to be quiet, you know. So they they're calling out here in the same way. It's an example of that, which is pretty cool, you know. The way of salvation, you know, the way of Yeshua. It's pretty awesome. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas, and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers, and brought them to the magistrate, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city, and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. Mm. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison, and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Now can you imagine the faith that's being build, built by that, okay? They're, they're beaten, they're hurt, and through having trials and tribulations and temptations, testing, and they fall down and start worshiping God and praying, okay, through song, and the prisoners see that, okay? So they're seeing their great faith. Paul, right, and Silas, okay, now watch what's fixing to happen, now imagine how this built all the prisoners' faith up, and probably had many of them that believed in the, pri the doesn't talk about the prisoners, but I guarantee you many of the prisoners will believe after seeing all this. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loose. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. So see, can you imagine, see the earthquake and all that other stuff that it... it boosted the the um, prisoners faith you know so they will believe in Jesus and we're fixing to see that he, the guard you know the, the 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 keeper there he's fixing to believe and all his household then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said sirs what must I do to be saved and they said Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Amen. <laughs> and they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straight Amen. Amen. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Okay, so you see... Um, they, they believed in the house. They had house church. They all got saved in there. So they got baptized outside of a church and saved outside of a church. Okay. So I think that's pretty awesome. Um, okay. Yeah, we'll stop there on that one. Okay. So also um, we can see in right here, these are very interesting because these are Paul speaking of house churches all over the country back then. Um, and all, where all the, the major churches were. Okay, like the Corinthian church and um, the um, the church in Colossians and all those churches and in Roman the Roman churches there was ma the main buildings right where they got together. But you were fixing to see that there's also many people who worshipped and had house churches. Okay, we can see that in Romans sixteen five. Likewise, great the church that is in their house. Okay, so they had church in their house there in, at the Roman church. Also, we can see in um, 1 Corinthians 16, 16, uh, oh, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 16, 15 through 19. It says uh, the same thing, that there's church in these people's house. I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. That ye submit yourself. So he's saying, you know, this is the first house that, that was um, set up there, 
okay, the the first church house that was set up there, and that they um, that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. They've devoted themselves over to the ministry of the saints. Okay. Elves unto such and to every one that helpeth with us and laboreth. I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus. For that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. For they have refreshed my spirit in yours. Therefore acknowledge ye them that are such. The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Okay, well, from the church that is in their house, Priscilla, okay. So, um, we see that, okay. We can also see um, in Colossians 4, 15 through 18, says this. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphus, and the church which is in his house. And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea, and say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds. Amen. Grace be with you. Amen. Okay, so you see, um, that they he had what the church which is in his house. Okay, um, and then to end it also, it can also mean like the um, the family. Uh, the um, a church can also mean a very large family in their house having church because they're such a big group of family. You know, a lot of brothers and sisters and cousins and things like that, and mother and father, grandmother, grandmother, grandfather, all that. All together, they are so large that Paul calls them a church, a family, okay? Relatives. We can see that in uh, uh, Philem Philemon, I always forget, Philemon, or if you have to say that, one, uh, one through six. The letter of Paul to Philemon. Philemon, sorry. <laughs> Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Aphia, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Okay. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers. Okay, so you see, um, that is speaking of to the church in your house, which here, if you, you know, research it some, look at some of the commentaries and stuff, he's not speaking of the church in their house like he is on the other ones. He's speaking of the big family that he has there. Okay, so I think that's pretty interesting too, and I just wanted to point that out. That it's a, you know, you can, church can mean different things, okay? It can mean a fam large, very large family, all believing and coming together and fellowshipping together, but can also mean a house church or a church building and all those things, okay? So that would be the end of Don't Stop Going to Church. You know, we should go to the church buildings, uh, even the ones like in Peter where it says that are in Babylon, and teach the people, help the people, get people saved cast out the demons and things like that they're in there we go to home churches we go into the world itself and help people and get people saved to make disciples um we go to the marketplace right and Bab marketplace is babylon you know but we go there and we help people and get people saved right and make disciples of all the earth we got to go to all the earth all the places okay all right well thank you guys uh wake and watch for yeshua god is love and all of god amen